provider to look at some of the, the data that's out there. Um, these are the molecules that you see. One is THC, one is cannabidiol or CBD, and the other one is a synthetic uh, THC or granabinol that's been around for over 30 years. Um, and you can see molecularly they look very similar, uh, but those are the molecules and they do work a little bit differently. I'm going to talk a little bit about that here in a second. Um, it's important, I think that Dr. Sabetta already covered this, it's important to differentiate between what's a cannabis-based medication and what's medical cannabis. Uh, cannabis-based medications are extracts, they are uh, well-defined, they have uh, known content. Uh, examples are Epidiolex or Cannabidiol, which is approved FDA for uh, pediatric seizures. Uh, they, the people that fast-tracked that through the FDA from Alabama were, wrote my seizure chapter, so I do have an all-star cast in my book. Uh, medical cannabis, on the other hand, are parts of the plant, the buds, the flowers, the extracts. Unfortunately, they're terribly regulated and poorly tested for contaminants. Um, but why do people go see the doctor? You know, hypertension, obesity, asthma, diabetes, etc. cetera. Um, in the, the National Ambulatory Care Survey data shows in the top 20 reasons, there's only one pain diagnosis, and that's knee pain, probably osteoarthritis of the knee. And other things that are not there are cancer, seizure, fibromyalgia, PTSD, et cetera. Um, but there's a nice scoping review as to why people seek out use of cannabis. Uh, this is a Pratt study. Review of all the reviews, it's pain. is the most common reason why people seek out use of cannabis. And I, although I know I sound like a nihilist, I mean, I do believe firmly that there's components of the plant that might be helpful from an analgesic or pain relieving perspective, uh, but it shouldn't get a, 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 a free pass and bypass the FDA drug development pro protocols for medications. Um, this study was nice because if you look at the therapeutic window of pain relief, it's between 16 and 30 nanograms per ml, uh, but as soon as you get higher than that, there, uh, there's something called hyperalgesia, which actually contributes to pain. Um, but even though I don't believe per se limits for driving impairment are, are worthy, uh, in Colorado, 5 NGs per ml is what they would define as driving impaired. So you need a lot of marijuana in your system to have any type of impact on pain. But there's a very tight relationship between the opioids and the cannabinoid receptors. Uh, for example, the Youth Risk Behavior Survey in 2020 is the number one risk factor for an adolescent to misuse their opioids as having ever used marijuana. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the JAMA Pediatrics article from a couple of years ago that, and I was surprised, I'm a pain physician um, from Colorado, uh, and, but if you look at the developing brain, the early onset users have a much higher addiction rate than compared to opioids in that very young population, 12 to 17 years of age. Um, and Wadaker from the Midwest, a very interesting uh, paper, the predominant predictor of an adult to misuse their opioids is having used marijuana before, his, before the age of 18. Um, if you look at Olson's study from 2018, this is a very massive study, and the concern I have about it is that they, they were looking at potencies that were much less than they are today, uh, but cannabis use increases your risk of developing opioid use disorder or opioid misuse. And the, uh, the National Road State Survey, the FARS data, drivers testing positive for marijuana were much more likely to test positive for prescription opioids. So again, this tight relationship between opioids and cannabinoids. So here's some of the, the national and international pain societies that do not endorse the use of cannabinoids for pain. The International Association for the Study of Pain, the Faculty of Pain Medicine from the Australian and New Zealand College of Anesthetists. Um, so you've got the New Zealand Pain Society, the Australian Pain Society, the British Pain Society, the European Pain Federation. They don't support its use, um, except for, and the thing I like about the European Pain Federation is the first national, international uh, pain organization to address potency. Um, and they don't recommend use more than 12.5% THC. And they don't, it was basically the first organization to have basically a black box warning between co-prescribing of centrally acting substances like we have with opioids and benzodiazepines here. They don't recommend using cannabis-based medications in patients using those types of medications. Um, the uh, UK data, they don't even recommend offering CBD to manage chronic pain unless part of a clinical trial. Um, here's some very good data from Colorado. Uh, I live in El Paso County, about an hour south of Denver, and this is, this is going back to when we first legalized for medical use. Um, and 90% of the medical marijuana cards in Colorado are for pain, um, and the platform to legalize is gonna help our drug problem. And the darker the color, the worse our drug overdeaths have been. 
And so we implemented, we voted for Amendment 20 in 2000, 2000, implemented in 2001. So here's the Colorado death rate over time. In 2002, five, eight, 11, and 14. So it's gotten worse. So it really goes against the, the grain of the platform to legalize that our drug problem's gonna get better. I can tell you it simply got worse from that. Um, you know, we, our deaths are going up despite prescriptions going down. Here's the Colorado data, and a lot of these drugs play well in the sandbox together. So in 2000, we, we voted, implemented in 01, and you can look at all the other substances like cocaine, methamphetamine, um, heroin, and fentanyl. Over time, this is the 2019 data, uh, prescription opioids they continue to go up. Despite in 2009, we had de facto legalization in Colorado. We voted to legalize in 2012 and implemented in 2014. Uh, there's the 2020 data, it looks like the COVID curve. Um, and to be honest with you, I thought fentanyl just kind of spun off into its own little beast. Uh, but I'm gonna present a little data that there's a relationship here. Uh, and there's the 21 data. So they actually had, a, the, the people I know at CDPHE, our public health department, had to compress the graph because our drug overdoses are just going through the roof, despite that platform. So here's a paper I published uh, last year, because uh, one of the, one of the uh, reasons to, to expand marijuana is gonna help reduce opioid dependency mortality, but in conclusion, opioid deaths have increased more where marijuana was legalized. And here's the, the fentanyl death rate across the US. And you can see the marijuana legalizing states have a much higher fentanyl death rate. So there is this relationship between uh, expansion of marijuana programs and multi-substance uh, deaths, including fentanyl. Um, this was a, uh, another paper that just came out last month. Uh, legalized marijuana, medical marijuana, particularly available through retail dispensaries, have a higher opioid mortality. So they reached the same conclusion we did, although it was a very independent study. Um, just, a, a, I was curious, as a, a being a, a pain physician in Colorado, what it was like or what it would take to get my medical marijuana card. So I actually was approved for, my, I have my medical marijuana card in Colorado. I was approved in 60 seconds. <laughs> Um, they never asked me my level of pain, um, which on a day-to-day -day basis, because I need my knee replaced as a very active person. Uh, about a zero to two, uh, but I was approved for severe pain in one minute. A minute, and then I got renewed the following year in a matter of two minutes with no questions asked. Um, in Washington, D.C., you do not even need a physician oversight to become a medical marijuana patient, and they implemented that in July of 2022. And you see the number of medical marijuana patients in D.C. have gone through the roof because you don't need a doctor's supervision anymore. So I'm going to circle back to this relationship between opioids and cannabinoids in the JAMA pediatric study. Uh, here's the graphic. So if you look at the first and third line in the young, early onset users, age 12 to 17, uh, if there's an addiction rate of about 10, 11 percent similar in cannabis and opioids about a year later. But three years later, marijuana has a much higher addictive potential than opioids. And as a pain physician, I was very surprised. I thought the opioids would be far more addictive in anybody, including the young people. Uh, but if you look, the, the, if you delay onset of use to 18 to 25, again, they have a lower addiction rate at that first year, but, and very similar. But three years later, still the, the cannabis users, even though the, the onset of, uh, is delayed, still have a higher uh, addiction rate after three years. Uh, here's a, I'm going to shift gears a little bit, talk about the Colorado uh, exposures in pediatrics because nobody wants kids to get into it, but that unfortunately is just continuing to happen. And Dr. Lev is going to talk a little bit about her experiences with that. Um, in JAMA, American Academy of Pediatrics, just a couple of months ago, again, uh, Luke had alluded to the 1,300% increase of uh, pediatric exposures. Um, 23% of those patients are admitted to the hospital. Some of the data shows 4% of those kids end up on a ventilator in the ICU. Uh, we have here's the, the data showing the pediatric ingestions over time. Uh, the uh, academic pediatrics last year uh, going up. Uh, and CDPHE, the frequent marijuana use by Colorado youths has association with psychotic disorders. I mean, I do give Colorado a lot of credit for monitoring this data and publishing this data that you have access to. So you can get this on the CDPHE website. So daily or near daily marijuana use by adolescents and young adults strongly associated with developing psychotic disorders such as schizophrenia into adulthood. And that's very consistent with the, the UK data and the European data uh, that uh, uh, Sir Robin Murray and his wife Marta DeForte have published uh, the strong link between uh, first episode psychosis and high potency marijuana, which they consider 10%. 
which in Colorado really doesn't exist. I think the average smoked flour is about 20%, and we have the concentrates that are averaging 50%, and then you get into the dabs, waxes, and shatters that are pushing 85, some claiming 100% THC. Um, marijuana is the most prevalent substance found in completed teen suicide in our state. That never used to be the, the case. Uh, nearly double in that, uh, that age group, 15 to 19 years of age. Um, 30, nearly 33% or third of the uh, adolescents that complete suicide uh, that do, they do toxicology have marijuana compared to alcohol, which is number two, uh, about 17%. That trend shifted in 2012. It used to be alcohol followed by marijuana. And once we legalized and expanded and normalized marijuana use, somehow marijuana has become the most prevalent substance when kids complete suicide in the state. Um, in older people, age 65 and up, uh, this came out just a couple months ago. There was a significant rise, 1,800% of hospitalizations for those over the age of 65. And there's the graphic. Um, so, you know, in, in older people, they tend to be on more medications. There may be drug-drug interactions. I mean, that population may have problems with memory, cognition, and balance. And you're going to add another substance that can impair memory, cognition, and balance. Um, so they're ending up in the emergency department. Uh, so just a summary, a quick action plan. Uh, cannabis isn't a medication to plant. We have a lot of plant-based medications. The FDA has done a really good job at, you know, have, they have an established process uh, to develop these medications, and I, I don't think cannabis should get a free pass. Uh, we should support the drug development process for cannabinoids. I mean, I, I'm not a nihilist. I mean, if you gave me a cannabinoid that was proven uh, to be effective, not contaminated, purified, and proven to help somebody in pain, I'd be 100% supportive of it. Uh, I think we should have the potency cap. I mean, the, the, the data is very clear. Anything more than 10% uh, may increase your risk of mental health disorders. Uh, home grows are breeding grounds for illegal activity. Uh, you have to track and monitor public health impacts. So there's not enough time to go into all this information on healthcare utilization, at the level of like emergency room, uh, birth defects, uh, what's happening to these uh, substance exposed uh, babies, environmental impacts, drug testing and all violent crimes, adolescent use, Discourage smoking, vaping, discourage use during pregnancy and lactation, like the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, uh, and American Academy of Pediatrics, and she did drug testing on all suicides, including adolescents. And, and uh, Luke mentioned the driving related fatality. So it was kind of the impetus for me to edit a medical textbook. I have 70 authors from four countries and 20 chapters and a year and a half.